Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. This is Biochemistry One. Our topic today is the pentose phosphate pathway, or for reasons that will emerge over the next few minutes, it's sometimes called the pentose phosphate shunt. So let's put this, uh, it's an alternative fate for glucose. So this is a different view of glycolysis than you're used to. Glucose is near the center, uh, top center, and then proceeding leftward and looping back around, I'm sorry, proceeding rightward and then looping back around leftward is uh, the complete glycolysis all the way to pyruvate. Let me call your attention to the fact that the second intermediate is glucose 6-phosphate, and that in turn is turned into fructose 6-phosphate as the... Um, as glycolysis proceeds. This, of course, should be for very familiar to you by now. We've talked about it extensively in earlier segments. The pentose phosphate pathway, or shunt, branches off from glycolysis at glucose 6-phosphate. So in other words, it's an alternative fate that glucose 6-phosphate can pursue. So let's look at the, the sort of uh, um, economics of this, and then let's start digging into the details. So this is a one a balanced equation for the um, uh, pentose phosphate pathway, which makes it obvious why it's called a shunt. So this balanced equation, you start with six um, G6PDs, um, uh, I'm sorry, G6Ps, glucose 6-phosphates, six NADs, three waters, you end up with uh, uh, six reduced NAD phosphates, hydrogen ion, three CO2s released, and then what, F6P is what, fructose 6-phosphate, a glycolytic intermediate, and then GAP. Do you remember what GAP is an abbreviation for in this context? Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, another glycolytic intermediate. So you can look at this as an alternative way of starting at glucose 6-phosphate and ultimately getting to, um, fructo to back to the partway down the glycolytic cycle. So hence the, hence the phrase uh, shunt that's sometimes applied to this. But in fact, the reasons for this are, are, are much more uh, interesting and important than this simple little equation. Um, um, implies. So this is the first look at what looks a little complicated at first glance. This is the entire pentose phosphate pathway. It's complicated in two ways. There are several new molecules that we haven't seen before here uh, as intermediates in the pathway, and it's uh, it branches, and it has um, several reversible reactions, creating what looks a little complicated at first glance, but is in fact uh, surprisingly easy to understand once you grasp its purpose and its design. All right, so this is that same balanced equation you saw a moment ago. We can break it down in two parts. There's an oxidative part in which uh, uh, NAD phosphate, reduced NAD phosphate is generated, and then there are reversible uh, anabolic parts in which uh, uh, different sugars are epimerized or isomerized into one another to yield anabolic intermediates. Uh, again, this, these equations are a little austere. They don't give you a complete picture. As we start looking at the details, your, the picture will get richer and more complete. Okay, so again, here is that the entire pentose phosphate pathway. We're obviously going to zoom in and look at these pieces one at a time. Uh, but um, let's so let's look at what's called stage one. That's the first step that branches off of glycolysis. So we start with G6P, and then instead of isomerizing it to fructose 6P, which is what glycolysis would do, we're going to oxidize it. Let's look at that. So we're going to take this uh, glucose 6-phosphate, and we're going to pull it into the pentose phosphate pathway by oxidizing it. Okay. So here it is again, see, sitting right there. And this is glucose 6-phosphate. Here is just a different depiction of glucose 6-phosphate. And glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, the first unique enzyme of the oxidative branch, as you'll see it's called, uh, of the pentose phosphate pathway is here. And notice it produces 6-phosphoglucolactone. Uh, so what's being done here is that a, uh, a reduced NAD phosphate is being generated while we oxidize the carbonyl compound that makes the uh, hemiacetal in uh, glucose 6-phosphate to a carboxylic acid. And a carb, see that here? The, the uh, carbonyl um, uh, compound in the glucose has been oxidized to an acid. So the cyclic carbonyl is a hemiacetal. The cyclic ester, uh, carboxylic acid ester, is called a lactone in this context. Okay, and notice that NAD phosphate is the re is the redox cofactor. We are generating reduced NAD phosphate. You may recall in several of our, of our earlier topics, we've been talking about consuming reduced NAD phosphate uh, in biosynthesis of cholesterol, fatty acids, for example. One of the primary ways in which we generate 
that reduced NAD phosphate that we need is in fact here in the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. As you'll see, we generate another in a moment. Let's stop and actually digress into an important topic, um, point of emphasis. So there's both NAD and NAD phosphate. We've talked about it before. Reduced NAD is generated typically in the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, for example, or in glycolysis. <coughs> And because it's used as a redox cofactor to drive catabolic metabolism ahead, normally the ratio of NAD plus to reduce NAD is kept very high. In other words, there are many molecules of oxidized NAD for each reduced NAD. The converse is true of NAD phosphate. In this case, the ratio is very low. In other words, almost all the NAD phosphate is reduced NAD phosphate. There, it's about 100 to 1 in one case and about 100 to, uh, 1 to 100 in the other case. So NAD and NAD phosphate, even though they're very similar molecules, identical really in their catalytic capabilities, that phosphate, its presence or absence, causes them to be recognized by a completely different set of enzymes, and so they are, in fact, two completely separate compartments. NAD phosphate is used for anabolic purposes, biosynthesis. NAD is used uh, essentially exclusively for catabolic purposes. And these two redox pools are, have a very, very different status. So one of the goals of the so-called redox arm, or, or I'm sorry, oxidative arm of the pentose phosphate pathway is to keep most of the NAD phosphate in the cell in the reduced condition so that it can drive biosynthetic processes. Okay, back to the main thread here. So glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase generates a reduced NAD and oxidizes the carbonyl to an acetic acid. Second step is simple. We just take this cyclic lactone and we linearize it. There's a lactonase that will do that. In fact, this reaction goes just spontaneously. The enzyme simply speeds it up a little bit and makes it a little more efficient, a little faster. And it's the hydrolysis of the lactone to generate, uh, to take us from the cyclic molecule to the linear molecule that is going to be the substrate for the next step. And in fact, all the other molecules in the um, pentose phosphate pathway are uh, most conveniently thought of as linear and often are, in fact, in linear form. Okay? So before I go any further, uh, we're going to talk about the names of all the different uh, um, carbons, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, carbohydrates, intermediates in the pentose phosphate pathway. Notice that every one of them has a term has a phosphate ester on its terminus. And so we'll talk about glucose 6-phosphate, um, uh, uh, phosphogluconate, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, ribose 5-phosphate. Uh, in some sense, we'll, uh, I'll often just slip and talk about the sugar because every one of them has a phosphate. It's redundant to say that you're talking about the uh, pentose phosphate pathway and then name the phosphate. Uh, so it, it, that's a big reduction in the complexity of what you have to remember in looking at this, uh, this slightly intimidating uh, set of reactions. Every one of them has a terminal phosphate, a terminal phosphate ester, uh, a phosphate ester oh, on the back end of the molecule away from the carbonyl or carboxylic acid moieties, which are going to play such a large role in the reactions that we'll talk about in the next few minutes. So it's essentially like a, a tail, a back end tag, this phosphate ester. Okay. All right, so now we're going to take the next step, the second redox step, is to take phosphogluconate, 6-phosphogluconate, 6-phosphogluconate, or we can just think of it as the gluconate, and oxidize it, uh, do an oxidative decarboxylation to produce ribulose, ribulose 5-phosphate. So notice that we uh, both decarboxylate, so this is an oxidative decarboxylation, and we generate a new um, reduced NAD phosphate. Notice that we've uh, gotten rid of the carboxylate and we've now uh, oxidized a alcohol to a carbonyl in the process. Okay. Here is that reaction in more detail. Notice what we do here. First, we uh, oxidize that internal alcohol to a carbonyl with uh, to a, a ketone group, a carbonyl uh, group, uh, catal a reaction catalyzed by the, the nicotinamide business end of NAD phosphate in this case. And then that uh, beta keto acid is quite unstable, and the carboxylate, the enzyme catalyzes the same enzyme catalyzes the release of that unstable uh, terminal carboxylate, uh, carboxylic acid to produce the decarboxylation that we see here. So it's a it's a quick sequence two step reaction catalyzed by the same enzyme. So in, it, we can think of it as an oxidative decarboxylation, though it's actually oxidation followed by rapid decarboxylation. All right, so. That's the f those are the first two steps, and this is in fact stage one, phase one. As we'll see in the next couple of minutes, this is what's...